These women thought they'd met the man of their dreams. Then the lies began to unravel. Brody from Melbourne was 19 when she was duped by her partner. Peter Asterisk told Brody he was divorced. He took her on overseas holidays. They looked for houses to buy together. He said he wanted her to be the mother of his children, and for several years the couple tried for a baby. Four and a half years after meeting Peter, Brody's world collapsed. Erin from Sydney is sharing her story of deceit to warn others of the potential pitfalls of relationships with narcissistic men. Her ex-partner was convicted of obtaining money by deception after claiming he needed funds for cancer treatment. She would later find out it was a lie. Erin had a date with an Irishman, John McVeigh. He told her that he had brain cancer, but it was in remission. McVeigh moved into Erin's apartment. She loved and cared for him. Two and a half years later, she went to the police. The endless stories I've heard, Gordon told Judith his work required him to spend chunks of time interstate and overseas for his consultancy work. Helen fell in love with Craig, who told her he was in the Special Forces. Mark told Natasha he was a senior executive at a major company and had multiple investment properties. Chris told Genevieve he was a wealthy businessman and polo player with a grand house in England, he too said he had been in the Special Forces and had shot someone. Everything was a game for him. I don't think he had one sincere bone in his body, Genevieve told me during a recent Zoom conversation. These are just some of hundreds of stories I've heard from women who have survived devastating relationships with emotional abusers, manipulative serial predators who tell extraordinary lies, often in the service of building and maintaining fake personas. Frequently, after years in a relationship, women discover that almost everything their husbands or partners told them was fiction. Yet, amazingly, financial is rarely their motivation for the deception, few of the men I've been told about asked for money. I just think that was his way of life, says Genevieve, reflecting on Chris's behavior. It wasn't financial. In almost every case, chinks in the men's stories grew until the women became detectives and investigated their ex-partners, often bonding with an other woman in the process. It was only then they learned about the mental disorders this behavior matches, antisocial or narcissistic personality disorder. I shared my own love story that ended as a detective story in my 2019 book Fake, a startling true story of love in a world of liars, cheats, narcissists, fantasists and phonies. In the book, I unfold my story of Joe Asterisk, a man I met through a dating app Joe was not who he said he was. The romance did not have a happy ending. Revealing my vulnerabilities and my shame was difficult, but I felt compelled to share my story. The more I came to understand his jaw-dropping behavior, the more important I decided it was to describe it so other women might learn to identify red flags and swerve away from similar relationships. Stephanie and Joe. While I wrote fake, I had a part-time job at Australian Story. As I worked behind the scenes, the last thing on my mind was that I might end up in front of the camera. After the book was published, I told friends I was done with the subject matter. But I had not accounted for the volume of messages from people, a few men, but mostly CIS gender women, relating stories with remarkable similarities. They flooded my inbox. The women's overriding message was that reading my story helped alleviate the deep shame they felt for not seeing through their partner's lies. Many who contacted me thought they were the only ones to have ever experienced such a relationship. I decided it was important to revisit the subject. Over the past months, I've interviewed nearly 50 women for Australian Story and heard an unimaginable range of examples of deceit and emotional cruelty in relationships. Stephanie was awed by hundreds of emails after she published her book Fake, in which she shared her personal story of love and lies. I believe this largely hidden phenomenon of emotional abuse, narcissistic abuse, is way more common and devastating than anyone might imagine, and needs to be considered an arm of domestic abuse. Several women I spoke with revealed that after they discovered the truth about their exes, 
they attempted suicide or were admitted to mental health units. When you are assaulted physically there are the wounds for all to see, a woman called Sarah wrote in an email to me. He stole my faith, my courage and my energy and has driven me to the edge of my sanity. This is violence. I thought I was crazy. Brody, a 27-year-old from the outer suburbs of Melbourne, is one of the women who courageously agreed to talk to Australian Story. She was 19 and living at home with her mother, Charlene, when she met Peter at a pub in 2015. He swept me off my feet. He was charming. He was kind and very sweet. He made me feel confident, made me feel safe. Brody and her partner, Peter, were together for more than four years. Peter, who was 19 years older, told Brody he was recently divorced and lived with his elderly parents. Brody, young, lovely, hopeful, felt she'd found safe harbor. And Peter's loving was intense. Often, he dropped off breakfast for her. If she was having a bad day, he took flowers to her work. He brought her presents. He took her away for weekends and to Bali three times. He told me he wanted to marry me. He wanted me to be the mother of his kids, she says. He was my best friend, the love of my life, my soul mate. I just couldn't see a future without him. Brody and Peter. Peter visited her three nights a week, but never slept over, he said his parents needed him. On weekends, he popped in then left, he didn't want to leave his parents for too long or had to be with his children. Frequently, he cancelled plans at the last minute. Alarm bells were ringing for Brody, but whenever she confronted him he would come up with plausible stories, tell her she was the problem, gaslight her. He told me all the time that it was all in my head, that I had issues. I thought I was definitely crazy, that maybe because of my past relationship, I was just having insecurities about trusting somebody. Two years into Brody and Peter's relationship, they decided to stop using contraception and try for a baby. One day in the shower, Brody noticed Peter had stitches. She assumed he must have had a vasectomy. She was devastated. He was on my floor crying hysterically. He was like, it's not what you think. He told me he'd got a reversal vasectomy for me. Later, he texted her a photo of a pamphlet about reversals. He said he hadn't had the courage to tell her that he'd previously had a vasectomy. He had an answer for everything and the answer always made sense, Brody says. After six months trying to conceive, the couple went to a fertility specialist. Preliminary tests, including a sperm sample test, showed there was no reason they shouldn't be able to have a baby. Around the same time, they decided to move in together. As I have learned, these men's stories are always complex and include twists and turns and highs and lows that seem calculated to throw their partners off balance and into a state of confusion, distress and anxiety. Lies are easier to conceal in intricate detail and often manufactured chaos. Brody says she regrets shutting out her mother when she was in denial about the red flags in her relationship with Peter. Broder's emotional and mental trauma are laid bare in her diary. Broder's mother Charlene has been supportive throughout the ordeal. For the next year, Brody spent her spare time looking at houses. Eventually, their application for a rental property was accepted, but when she called the real estate agent to check on things, the agent said Peter had called to say they didn't want the house anymore. When she asked Peter, he said the agent was lying and he hadn't said that. Instead of renting, he said, they would buy land. They looked at land and got quotes for display homes. He changed his mind again and said they'd buy an existing property. Brody eventually found a house he approved of, but when it came time to pay the deposit, Peter didn't have the money. Then he said they'd move into his investment property. They went shopping. We spent over $10,000. We tested out couches. We spent money on everything you needed for the kitchen. We organized delivery dates. Brody packed her stuff at home into boxes, ready for the move. Another snafu, 
Peter told her the tenants were refusing to move out and he'd have to take them to 